So through the lecture, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. I do have you on the side here. And yeah, so let's talk about structural family therapy. And again, here's the chart. So we are down here, still in the classical schools um, that are influenced by cybernetics and general systems theory. So all we have left is structural family therapy, which we're covering tonight, and then experiential family therapy. And that's our class. Then in your next class, you'll be going over these other models here. So for um, your forum discussion, um, you will have to basically answer these questions. We're not going to go over tonight um, because that's due in Sakai. But um, the forum discussion is just asking you a question about a family in which you will have to apply some of those structural family therapy um, interventions and basically, you know, like how you see it from a structural family lens. So that's coming up next week. And you will also have to watch this video, the Tres Madres, um, which is an Anglo-Hispanic family. Um, and for that, you will have to answer questions around the structure of the family, what structural themes you noticed, and you will have to describe at least two interventions um, used in the video um, that are from the structural family approach. So let's start off here. Again, some of us already know this. So Salvador Minuchin was the pioneer um, or the developer of this model. And he was born in 1921 in Argentina. And um, Salvador Minuchin was a psychiatrist. He earned his degree in child psychiatry, and um, he studied psychoanalysis in New York City. He was certified in 1967. During his training as an analyst, he worked um, as a psychiatrist at the Willicks School. I'm not sure if that school is still open in New York City. So he found that traditional psychoanalysis didn't have sufficient treatment for those boys or those residents. So he began to kind of like experiment with family therapy. So he would then bring the parents and have basically family therapy with the boys at the school or where they were incarcerated. So after that, in 1965, he was offered a position as a director of the Philadelphia Child Guidance Center, where he um, became the director eventually of that. And this was kind of like where, when Minoshin developed his therapeutic approach, this is where structural family therapy really um, started at the Philadelphia Child Guidance Clinic. So. You might be asking yourself, you know, structural family therapy, what it sounds like we're working with some sort of structure here, right? But this model kind of like emphasizes the structural change. And it honestly focuses on the therapist as the active agent of change. So the therapist, like I said before, is the main um, coordinator of promoting change. In, in that. So this model has been successful in um, so many treatments like the psychosomatic conditions, um, and it has been recorded through research, empirical validated research, um, and it gained its reputation in 1960s actually through empirical validated research. Structural family therapy can um, in, uh, has been useful in all ranges of emotional conditions, like in mental conditions. So through not only family problems, but also, you know, like use with individuals in working with their own structural changes in their own families or in with couples too. But it's mainly used um, with families and that's how Minoshin kind of like started um, its use. So the model conceptualizes the family as a living open system. And you might want to remember that living open system because 
it, what that means is that members are interdependent and members can like go trend go over different transformations in evolutions think about general systems theory here think about how general systems says hey you know we're all part of something we all are part of a um, system so that's that's what Minutian is saying here that the family is a living open system and each person is interdependent of that system. Family process is regulated by multi-level interplay of homeostasis and change. So there are many different levels in families. Again, think about structure, how families get structure, how families get embedded in, into the multi-levels of different dynamics within their own um, open living system. What this means is that sometimes families fail to adjust to the rules to that are enforced by the external or even the internal influences that exist within their system. So their homeostasis or their dominant dynamic becomes the most dominant dynamic. So if a family fails to adjust to adhering to a rule or a system fails to adjust to adhere to a rule or a change, then the main homeostasis, the main dynamic becomes more dominant. That's why, you know, in this um, approach, we will see and hear um, terms like intergenerational coalitions, triangulations, conflict avoidance and lack of growth and differentiation which then come to therapy as a representation of the family picture in how the system is functioning. So most families come to our therapeutic spaces with all of these, you know, with their intergenerational coalitions, their triangulations, their conflict avoidance dynamics, their lack of um, differentiation, and that's what we, that's kind of like the snapshot that we get um, when we do an intake on a family or a couple. They're all bringing that in the first day they come to see you. So the problem here, as Minushin would state, is that families get stuck. So families get stuck in their dynamics, in, you know, like um, their lingo, their dance. And it is very hard for a family to get unstuck by themselves. So that's why, you know, they call us and as systemic therapists, if you get a call from a family that's in crisis, you already know that that family has tried so many other things, but all of their attempts to solving their problems have been unsuccessful. So families tend to wait until last minute to really come to therapy, family, as we know. And sometimes the reality is that they don't really come to family therapy. You, the systemic therapist, have to then engage members and make it relational. There are very few families that, um, even in my practice, that admit that we do need family therapy. It, it's very often one person that I start working with just one individual. And then I suggest, hey, what about if we bring your parent here? What about if we bring your, your partner? That's how it normally starts. It says the transactional and perceptual structure. So what's causing the problem? Instead of asking that question, what's causing the problem? Your main objective here is to assess the transactional structure in the patterns, assess transactions and the patterns that are happening in front of you um, live and ask questions that give you that information. Therapeutic change depends on the modification of the family structure. So if we want to achieve one second, third order of change, we first need to modify the structure. That was big and that still is big in structural family therapy because we're trying to restructure the dynamics. We're, we're trying to 
relearn new boundaries or even implement new boundaries in a system that's been boundaryless. So what Mnuchin used to do um, and what he believed was most needed was, you know, creating a therapeutic system in which, now, this is a little different than you, you as the therapist, as a structural family therapist, immersing yourself into the family system. So you would create a separate system in your space, in your therapy room, and you would call that the therapeutic system in which you would create boundaries, you would role model for people, um, and you would then create the structure that eventually would transfer into the actual family system. Any questions about that? So within that therapeutic system, your main purpose as a family therapist is to challenge, challenge boundaries, challenge the structure that the family's bringing, um, which then would then be used for the actual family system in, in creating change. So the therapist's function is to assist the family in restructuring, again, your participation as the therapist is sub subjective to creating boundaries to with 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 the families and with the people that you have in the room. The role is paradoxical. So, for example, the therapist needs to find the right equation of accommodation and challenge. And at different moments of their encounter with the family, the role can be compared to a job of a dancer, a stage director, a camera director, or a strange body in the family system. What that means is that you as a therapist would not only have to challenge the dynamics that you're seeing in the room, but you would have to coordinate the restructuring of all of these dynamics that are happening in front of you by challenging people. And I will show you uh, an example. This can be a little confusing, but I will show you an example on how to do that. So the therapist is not the primary, primarily there to listen um, or answer, answer sympathetically to what clients um, had to say. It, it wasn't like very sugar coating it was more it was very challenging and i invite you to look at videos online of Minoshin doing family therapy he was very directive he was straight to the point um and he challenged people so again think about the stance of of this new uh, model that you're learning about how you're showing up as a therapist you're very direct, you're challenging families, you're challenging people in the room, you're asking questions, you're, you're the director. You're, that's your role in that space. You're directing. Yes, Amber? Is the, the, that last part kind of made me think about, um, is it also another like self-correcting system in some ways? That's kind of what it brought up for me, the tune-up part, the naturally repairing. Yes. So think about what I said before. So the minute families enter your space, you're you're already starting um, to create a, a therapeutic system. You're not joining what they're bringing into your space. So you're already starting creating this therapeutic system. And in that system serves as a platform to, to learn for you, the therapist, to challenge them. So they can then apply that into their own family system. So you don't, it's not like the other models, you don't join the family system. You create a complete different system and the family joins your therapeutic system. And that's why you have the stands of a director in a different stance because that's your therapeutic system that you're creating in your space. And, it, and then hopefully they'll transfer that outside of that space too. This is like the practice dress rehearsal. Okay. Okay. Raquel. Thank you. In this therapeutic system, is it psychoeducational in the sense that 
the therapist would be elaborating on what they're seeing when they see like a subsystem within the family or, um, you know, like the role of the symptom of whoever the identified patient is. Are they directly telling the family what they're seeing or is it more uh, yeah. kind of strategic in the sense that they're kind of keeping some of that to themselves or are they like saying this is what's happening and like this is what needs to change? They're very direct. They're very straightforward. Um, that kind of like cranks up the heat for people. Yes, things are more out there. And I truly believe, I haven't read this, so don't quote me on this, but, you know, creating a therapeutic system like really uh, separates you as a therapist and separates the family from their own little dance and what they are used to. So it, it, it creates a separation from their stuff, their homeostatic state. And now they have to follow boundaries, rules in this new system. And hopefully they would apply that into their own system, into their own homeostatic um, um, spaces. Looking around, is, is that a little clear? Is that puzzling? Is that a little, that's a little different than the last models that we've touched on. It's clear, but I think it just, like, I'm imagining myself with a family that who knows what they're bringing into the room. I imagine it takes just a lot of confidence and a lot of, like, connection to your own self as a therapist and differentiation to be able to maintain that director position in the room um, with mm -hmm. all the emotions that might come up and be able mm -hmm. to, like, keep clarity in that absolutely and that's one thing about structural family therapy the again the you are responsible for change you are held responsible for the change that's supposed to happen because you're creating your own therapeutic system that's why you you're the conductor the director of that system and families are just like entering your system that you have created yeah Yes, Alexa. I guess I'm just wondering if families are like often resistant to this type of therapy or if it just kind of depends on the family and if they want more structure and more direct therapy or like, I guess. I, I would say that yes, some families are very resistant, especially if they're just so attached to their own homeostatic um, ways and states of being. Um, one major threat of a system is change. If families feel like, oh my gosh, my homeostatic state is, is about to change, that's making me scary because I don't know where this change is going to lead. So entering that therapeutic system, and I feel like as therapists, we, we already, we all create a therapeutic system in a way. We just don't name it like that because we're not all structural family therapist but in structural family therapy that your space your therapeutic space is seen as a therapeutic system in which people have to follow boundaries practice enact um things for you and again you're just directing them in hopes that things will stick and they'll change so that's your role as the therapist in this model um one of the first tasks um, for structural family therapists is to, again, enter the system that is in need of change. Um, first, we establish a working relationship. So the family comes in, we're already in our therapeutic system, we enter that system with them, and we, we start establishing the working relationship. This is why structural family therapy focuses so much on joining. Because if you're not well joined with families in your therapeutic system, they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to change. So this work and relationship requires a certain degree of accommodation. So you now, as the therapist, you are welcoming the family into your system. You're looking at the dynamics and you're accommodating to the rules to seeing, you know, like to you're paying attention to what they're bringing into your system. 
And accommodation means like you accepting their rules, what they're bringing into your space. And you try not to lose yourself in that. Too much challenge to a system or what the family is bringing at the entry level without proper joining would lead to the family dismissing you. They're not going to listen to you. Too much accommodation would eliminate you as a therapist and it would eliminate your input by you getting sucked into their homeostasis. So you have to find the right balance of how much am I challenging the rules that these families are coming with and how much am I accommodating? So there has to be a balance there. So the right equation of accommodation or challenge for a particular family is through process, the process of probing, asking questions, getting information, um, being curious. As you're asking questions, circular questioning, you're you're being curious in, in about their rules, their boundaries, as there's an open or closed system. All of that creates a space where the family now allows you, the family takes your input more seriously, basically, and, and they listen to you in a much better way, to say the least. You know? Again, um, structural family therapists are very actively engaged. They're in this therapeutic system, dancing with the family, again, with the right equation of accommodating and 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 challenging so you're just in with them so there is little room in this model for neutral listening or floating attention so you're paying attention to all the stuff that's happening all at once so how do structural family therapists do this first you approach them with your hypotheses you're, this is what I think as the therapist, this is what I think is happening based off, you know, our intake. This, these are my observations. And you approach them with your the hypothesis that you've created from the minimal information that you've gathered from intake. And then you proceed to test and expand or even recreate those hypotheses as you join with the family, as you have them in your therapeutic room. So you know, like as, as in other models, the attention is selectively oriented towards process and away from content. So this is a really good point to remember. So now we're, we're, we're paying attention to the process, what's happening in our therapeutic system here. As, as we're joining with the family, testing our hypotheses, correcting those hypotheses by probing and asking questions. But again, families come with a lot of content and sometimes they just want to tell you stories. So in order for you not to get sucked into their storytelling, which might benefit their homeostatic state, you have to remain very alert and again, kind of like a director in that space. Yeah, let's look at primary techniques. So structural family therapy, main technique are family structural mapping. It's kind of like a, it's very similar to a genogram, but again, um, Minoshin borrowed some ideas from transgenerational models and he created his own structural mapping. So what this is meant to do is to uncover and understand patterns of behavior and family interactions. And during this process, the therapist creates a visual representation that identifies the family, um, family's problems and how those issues are maintained through family dynamics. Mapping is the primary um, assessment technique used in structural family therapy. Um, it shows the basic structure of the family, um, it includes members of the family, um, their ages, gender, demographics. Um, sometimes we can see um, family rules depicted in this um, structural family mapping, patterns of behaviors, family hierarchies, 
who's at the top, who's in the middle, who's at the bottom. Um, so structural family therapists do this mainly at the beginning of their therapeutic process with families because it helps with engagement. It helps with, you know, getting a full picture of what's going on here, what's going on in the family. And um, it gives the therapist a better understanding of the family dynamics and structure. So that's what we're going to be working on tonight. We're going to be working on creating a family structure for the family, um, the case scenarios that I um, share with all of you. So for us to do that, let me just uh, share here. All right, so we have a 14-year-old girl who is being repeatedly suspended from school due to her fighting with schoolmates and disrespectful interactions with teachers. The referral indicates that she lives with her mother, stepfather, and one sibling. The birth father lives out of state. The family belongs to a church. In the first meeting with the family, the therapist learns that the 14-year-old girl is very close to her mom, has a distant relationship with her biological father and her stepfather, and fights often with her older sister. The therapist also finds out that the mother and stepfather often fight and fight about to raise the children. But the mother confronts the schools, the school about what she sees as unfair treatment of her daughter, and that not all the family members participate in the church, but only the mother. So when looking at this case, first let's talk about the demographics. Who do we have here? Who are the people that are coming to therapy, to family therapy? A 14-year-old daughter seems to be the identified patient. And mm -hmm. then I'm assuming that the mother is also coming to therapy as well as the sister and stepfather. I assume the whole family that's in that household is coming. Yep. So even if they're not coming to therapy or attending therapy, you still want to have those people in your structural map, even if they're not present in the room, okay? What were some of the highlights from this case? What did you get from this case? As a structural family therapist, I know you have very minimal, maybe minimal knowledge on the interventions, but just like as a systemic therapist, like, let's... Just say, like, what, what's your take on this family? What's happening? I think about the mother here as a very strong figure in the family who is going to battle for, going to battle with everyone um, for her children and fighting with stepdad, fighting with the school, um, but then also obviously concerned about her daughter getting in trouble this much um, but it seems like that her and the daughter are close and maybe there's some enmeshment there between the identified patient and the mother um, that's there needs to be some more boundaries so the mother can can kind of correct uh, what's going on at school with the daughter rather than siding with the daughter and essentially enabling her to disrespect her teachers in this way there's like some triangles triangles going there there seems like you're getting in this um structural lingo language yeah. i i i heard um boundaries yeah. that's big in structural family therapy and meshment what other things kind of um, piqued your attention from this case i was curious about and maybe this is because in the other one of our other case studies there were two siblings that were close and one was away and we saw that there were some issues there, but I'm, I'm very curious what, what the fighting with her older sister often. And I'm curious if the mom and older sister are close or not. Um, yeah, definitely wondering about that. And also I'm curious how long the stepfather has been in the picture and how long the father has been like out of state. So those are two areas that I think could have a lot behind them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So imagine now as you're meeting this family, maybe it's just the mom and the daughter that are coming to you to seek therapy. And maybe the mom is just bring, bringing the daughter because she's being rebellious and disrespectful. And then eventually you 
get around the idea of like, um, I want you more present in our sessions and you work that out with you know, with the girl and she finally accepts that she wants her mom in, in your session. So you make it relational. So now they're entering that therapeutic system with you. And think back about what I said earlier in the lecture. Now you have mom and the daughter in your therapeutic system. Now you, what are your main objectives, your main goals? Mine is to maybe test the hypotheses that you gathered from intake information. What are some of the hypotheses that you you might be as a as a clinician you might be thinking about based off you know, that little information that we just have here? Yeah, I guess one hypothesis I have um, that this is a pattern that the mother and the fourteen year old both are engaging in with other people within the system. Yeah. Yeah. That can be a hypothesis, absolutely. Yeah. As I'm imagining the map of the family, I'm seeing um, the two sisters in conflict and then the two parental figures in conflict. Mm -hmm. So now think about the ways you might test that hypothesis, that one specifically. How would you test that hypothesis in your therapeutic system I would thinking of the kind of and I don't know if it's the right the right wording for this but asking questions about when some of these issues come up and I'm imagining the mother and the daughter there and how they talk about what happened in both with the school and between the other sister and then between the parents and how they I'm just imagining stuff from my family now how no, they talk about like, yeah. Who did You're what right. and this and, and both like get angry with each other, but then also defend each other. I You're feel like right. that might happen. <laughs> Listen, we haven't even talked about interventions yet. And I'm, this is the lingo y'all following in here. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what you would do to test your hypotheses. Um, you would really clearly state those things that you see. And, and based off the information that you gathered, you can truly say, hey, I see this, this is, a, is this what it is? Like, and also you're looking at the dynamics in the room. How are they talking to each other? What type of messages are they sending to each other? Go back to meta communication, messages that are embedded within communication. And when communication is nonverbal, we, we're still communicating. So you would, again, pay attention to that. Um, test those hypotheses by clearly stating them and challenging them a little, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Any other thoughts before I show you the the first initial draft of their structural map? I guess mm -hmm. one other question is like, are they, the mom and daughter involved or over-involved? Yeah. You would then elicit questions around what's what's mom what's your involvement in your daughter's um life and and what's your relationship with? what's the stepdad the dad the bio dad involvement you would explore that yeah so this is the first initial draft so this would be done maybe in your second session with them and they're doing this in session with you so it's still, you know, like we see the system here. So we see who's in the system. This is the family system. So we see the daughter, the 14-year-old. We see the sister, 16, mom, 38, and the stepdad. So we, see, in, on the outside, we, we can see like who, who's outside of the system. Again, we have bio dad who's not in their system, the school in the church. So we have two major organizations here that are services that are influencing the family system in some ways. So as a circle family therapist, you would also include services or organizations that influence the main system. So still, it's not showing the richness of the family transactions, like how they relate. 
um, what are the patterns, what are the dynamics that exist in, in, in this family? We get kind of like a glimpse of, okay, these are the, the main players, basically. And in your second draft, as you continue to gather more information and um, test your hypotheses, you start kind of noticing how people relate with each other and you start asking relational questions. So now, now you can actually have these lines. This is the key, involvement, over-involvement or conflict, right? Or you can start drawing your lines from people to people. So it's sort of like a, the kind of like the genogram process here, but a bit different. So based off what you're currently seeing, what can you tell me about this family as you're looking at it right now? What's popping out to you? What's the most salient, evident things that are Raquel? I'm just really curious about what the stepfather and the sister do. Are they withdrawing when there's all this stuff going on? Are are they trying to be heard in some way too? You know, like, are they united? What is their relationship? Is the stepfather close to the other daughter? Or is he kind of like isolated from everyone? Um, yeah. Yeah. You're you're talking about stepdad here? And then what is, what is mom's relationship with the other sister? Yeah. It's a good question. I think there's a third draft here coming up. You might be able to see that. In the feet in the next slide yeah but what can you see from all of these dynamics that are in this second draft can you lots see triangles of... yeah go ahead <laughs> actually yeah triangles and lots of conflict mm -hmm. and i also noticed that there aren't any just uh involvement lines like there's over involvement there's conflict and there's under involvement that's mm -hmm. all we see at this point so knowing what you know about structural mapping and having that key at the in the other slide if i were to give you this map and tell you what do you see here you'll be able to tell me what this family dynamics is by just looking at the second draft what are your thoughts do you feel confident that you'll be able to tell me what's happening here no. so let's take a look at the third draft so as as they open up you're joining with them this is maybe session five or six depending on how well they have joined and you have joined with them in your therapeutic system if they feel safe enough to tell you about these relationships but by the i would say by the fifth seventh session you should have a good solid idea on what's what's happening here, what's happening with the school. I know I got a little information from the school and this is why mom is bringing the child. But now you can see mom's relationship towards the school and there is the same relationship here from the child. So if mom has this relationship with the school, what's the message? What's the meta communication that's being sent to the child about the school? And if mom and child are enmeshed or over, or there's an over-involvement here, there's an alliance here. And there might be an alliance against the school. That's what triangles tell us. Even in, in genograms, when you look at your genogram, the one that you just created, and you, you point out a triangle, that's information right there. Similarly here, when you look at these triangles, that information right there, same here. There is an alliance against the stepdad. And I'm pretty sure that if we had a line here, again, this is what needs to be worked on in therapy, for sure. There is not a lot of um, differentiation in the roles, in the hierarchical stances, what structural family therapy um, would look like, like at, you know, the, the hierarchical stances. You know, the notion believe that 
parents should always be at the top then the child subsystem in the middle then the sibling subsystem kind of like there in the middle but here we're seeing an imbalance in this family in this hierarchy because mom and daughter are at the top of the hierarchy and stepdad is maybe below them or way under them maybe sister is in the middle and stepdad is way way down any thoughts about structural mapping